The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. A lot of the problems that we face today, we have solutions for. Uh, it's just about humans making the right decisions and, and steering our future in the right direction. But I think a lot of the, the key critical problems that we're facing today, we can solve them. Uh, we just have to make the choice to do so. Then, later tonight. I don't think of the term replace when I think of AI. Um, and lots of people go there right away. I always think of augmenting. While many of us recently flocked to try out a new artificial intelligence app, some people paused to ask, where does this go now? A Canadian futurist who is founder and CEO of the tech education company Way has put a lot of thought into what's ahead. Her name is Sinead Bovell. She's on the United Nations Generation Connect Visionaries Board and a contributor to Wired Magazine. And Sinead Bovell joins us now. Hi. Hello. Thanks. It's such a pleasure to meet you in person. I've been following you on all the social media, so it's nice to see you in person. <laughs> you too, you as well. Uh, so you're a futurist. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? I think the name sounds a lot more glamorous and mysterious than it is, but essentially tracking a lot of data points, both qualitative and quantitative, and using it to build forecasts uh, and future scenarios. So tracking things from emerging technologies to patents to who's a company hiring, and using that to kind of make forecasts about where we could be headed. So you mentioned for forecasts, not predictions. Absolutely not predictions. That's yeah. an entirely different wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we seem to be um, living in what media is always saying, we're living in unprecedented in the times and, and a lot of people I think are feeling maybe less optimistic than they have in the last little while as a futurist what makes you optimistic about the future Right. So I think if we even just look at the trajectory of history, we have been improving in a lot of key metrics for humanity over time. Uh, but when we look out into the future, a lot of the problems that we face today, we have solutions for. Uh, it's just about humans making the right decisions and, and steering our future in the right direction. But I think a lot of the, the key critical problems that we're facing today, we can solve them. Uh, we just have to make the choice to do so. And so that's what keeps me quite optimistic and knowing that the optimistic scenarios are very much possible. And I think um, I want to come back to the decisions because tech seems to be moving at a faster pace than ever before. And sometimes the decisions we make now might not be decisions we make 10 years from now, but we'll get back to that in a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, you also help millennials and Gen Z enter the tech space. What's the demand been like over the past few years? In terms of them stepping into the, mm -hmm. the workforce? Do they feel more empowered to be in that space? I think they feel a lot more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, and especially for, for Gen Z, uh, technology has been a platform for them to use their voices. So I think their approach to it uh, is a lot more inspiring, a lot more encouraging, a lot, I'd say, a little bit more optimistic uh, than other generations. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're doing enough to educate people around it? Because I have uh, two small kids. And uh, over, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, they were online. And then before that, pediatrician said, no screens, no tech. and now it seems to be this little like push and pull. Um, we relied so much on technology during the pandemic for many different things. But then now it's like, oh no, we can't. Um, so do you, do you think that we know, do you think that we're, we know enough to make the decisions that we need to make forward? Or do we just need more education around it? I think a lot more education around it. And I think uh, for starters, a lot of our uh, vision of what technology is is devices, uh, but technology is things like software as well, so artificial intelligence. So tech education really needs to include those types of concepts for, for children as well, so they're prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just a matter of do we use iPads or do we not? Uh, should an AI be making this decision about us? Uh, or if an algorithm put this piece of information in front of us, can I think critically to know why it did that? Uh, those are the types of areas of tech education that I think are important, and I don't think we do enough of that. Um, you are a Canadian, mm -hmm. but you work in the States. Is, is it more challenging to enter the tech space here in Canada? In the last few years, I'd say no. I think Canada has really done 
a great job in opening technology as a lane mm -hmm. uh, and really helping some companies uh, form and, and build more of a sector here. Uh, prior to that, potentially, but uh, Canada is a strong, a strong player in the world of technology. Uh, I don't think we talk about it enough, but but we're playing a pretty big role. Well, you did um, uh, at Tech Talk uh, earlier this year, or last year mm -hmm. in 2022, and you shared this TED Talk about digital avatars. Right. And I'm just going to tell the audience, just prepare to have your mind blown. We're going to show a clip of it. This is Shudu Graham. She's a striking South African model, likely on the path to a supermodel. Scroll through her Instagram. You can see all of the big campaigns she's landed. She's been featured in Vogue a few times, which is kind of like the Holy Grail. And she's also an activist. She uses her platform as a rising black supermodel to call for more diversity in fashion. And I think that's incredibly admirable. There's another fact about Shudu. She isn't real. OK, um, what? <laughs> yeah, so Shudu is part of uh, an emerging field of digitally generated people, so digital avatars. She isn't powered by AI. She's a digital construction. Uh, but she books campaigns. She's been featured in Vogue quite a few times. And avatars and AI, as digital humans, will play a role in our future. Fashion modeling, uh, spokespeople, news anchors, we'll, we'll start to see them kind of creep into to more and more industries. You said news anchors and I started getting a little high under the collar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every, every industry is going to have to prepare for the future of work. Uh, and I think it seems a little bit shocking to see an AI or an avatar in the world of fashion modeling because we previously believed jobs that were more in creative industries were immune to technology. Uh, but I don't think any, any lane really is. OK, but let's unpack this a little bit because um, in the world of fashion, and you've been a model mm -hmm. before, in the world of fashion, there's not, there aren't that many uh, women of color in modeling. Um, and there are, not, there are very few women who are dark skin. So she's booking campaigns which means that she's making money. Um, first, who's behind Shudu and what other, I guess, complications does this create? Right, so the person who created and who controls Shudu is white and male, which means the future is heading in a direction where people can create and control identities outside of their own ethnic groups. This doesn't inherently have to be a bad thing, but it does provide a lot of opportunity for exploitation. So in the case of Shudu, you mentioned uh, Profit, for example. Shudu represents a real black fashion model, but the income her identity generates isn't going to black women. It's going to her creator, a white man. So we are financially shutting out black women uh, from these opportunities while their identity is still being profited off of. Uh, and for me, this raises quite a few red flags. What other red flags does it raise for you? Uh, so there's the idea of one being misrepresentation. Um, Judu is designed through the lens of, of a white man's vision. So her skin tone, hairstyles, all of that, it's, it's through his version of what he finds desirable. So there's a lot of opportunity for stereotyping, appropriating, and misrep misrepresentation, which marginalizes real black women. Um, and if you look at this kind of as a, as, a, as a lens to the future, you can see it playing out as a loophole for companies, right? So instead of having to invest in diversity or improve company culture, a company could just hire or create avatars instead from different ethnicities and kind of manipulate the, the relationship those groups may have with that company. Uh, so those kind of raise some red flags to me. And I think the final one is that we have to remember access to the market that creates avatars like Shudu, and especially more advanced ones that will be par powered by AI, it's not equal. There are certain structural challenges that make it harder for some communities to access resources, the time, skill, the capital to build these types of avatars. So we're more likely to see some dominant cultures uh, be the creators and owners and controllers, um, again, marginal further marginalizing already con marginalized communities. AI has been around for a while now. Why do you think we're, we're more concerned about it now? I think we are waking up to, we interface with it uh, a lot more. Um, I mean, social media has been a platform to kind of get these stories out a little bit faster. But I think it's, it's an intersection of us all just waking up to technology, whether it's uh, how our data is being used, which are the, what are the main companies that are kind of steering our future. We're starting to tune into that. Um, and I think it's a really good thing.
Well, we've been hearing a lot about ChatGPT, and Google has its own AI bot, uh, chatbot called uh, Bard, and shares recently um, in Alphabet, Google's parent company, sank more than 7%, knocking $100 billion off the firm's market value uh, when it answered a question incorrectly that was posted in an advert on Twitter. Um, but it still seems like an uncertain time for chatbots. What's your take? I think chatbots are going to be the future of how we largely interface with the internet and with technology. Uh, I think that they will play quite a dominant role. Um, when it comes to Google versus ChatGPT or OpenAI or, or Microsoft, I think that competition is good for, for us and mm -hmm. for consumers. Uh, it forces companies to innovate and bring, bring better products to, More accountable, to market. Yes, what does concern me with chatbots is that they aren't actually intelligent, right? They don't know what they're saying, mm -hmm. uh, and they sound incredibly scholarly, uh, but it could be complete nonsense. And when you have companies then competing uh, for a first place or to kind of be the first mover, it can get sloppy. Uh, and AI is a serious technology. It's not, it's not a joke to kind of mess around with. Uh, and so in this instance where, where Google, Google's chatbot Bard said something, you know, incorrect, if it had a lot more significance, if somebody was using that piece of information to make a critical decision with, uh, then that's not so great and it's not so you know, inconsequential. You mentioned earlier about the displacement of uh, jobs. I just wanted to go through some um, information here for a second and then mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that. Uh, the World Economic Forum released a report in 2020 saying that COVID shifted the way we work. The report concluded that the workforce is automating faster than expected and that 85 million jobs will be displaced displaced by 2025, which is now two years away. Uh, the robot revolution will create 97 million new jobs, but communities most at risk from disruption will need support from businesses and governments. Analytical thinking, uh, creativity, and flexibility among the top skills needed. Data and artificial intelligence, content creation, and cloud computing will be the top emerging professions. And the most competitive businesses will be those that reskill and upskill current employees. Is there a risk that this move towards automation won't create jobs um, more equitably? Absolutely. I think the, the fact or the point about it creating more jobs uh, is correct. I think if we look at historical trend lines, uh, technology has net-net led to, to more, more industries, new avenues. Uh, but how those jobs get created, who has access to them, uh, and who is given the resources, time, and skills to pivot towards them, that can absolutely be uh, a problem in terms of, of equity. And if we look in even the last 10 years, how income has kind of been divided, mm -hmm. it isn't trending in a direction that's favorable uh, or equal. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that's something that we need to be tuning into. Do you think, though, that maybe in some ways we're kind of just um, kind of, it's going to happen if eventually, right? So should we not adjust to this uh, very real probability? Yeah, I think we the technology isn't going away. Um, our future workforce will be more augmented by it than less. Uh, so we do need to, to lean into it uh, and try to minimize the potential gaps. I think if there's anything we can learn from the Industrial Revolution uh, is that you have to take care of your society and your citizens because uh, that's where the real problem lies, when people are left kind of to fend for themselves uh, economically, uh, their purpose, and otherwise. I think we now, the result, the numbers are in. Mm -hmm. We know which direction we're headed towards. We have an opportunity to prepare people as best we can. And I think it's really important that we, we take that. Um, AI goes beyond a chatbot. Now there are tools out there that can mimic someone's voice and create images that kind of like, there's been times when I'm like, is this real? Is this not real? There was a recent video of Steph Curry just like, you know, hitting the, the net, like getting the basket from all over the court. And I thought it was real. It was not real. Um, <laughs> what are the concerns around that? Mm -hmm, around authenticity mm -hmm. and transparency. And even just maybe like, you know, the deep fakes that we're seeing. Right, I think uh, deep fakes present quite a critical political, geopolitical threat um, that we don't really have a solution for at this point. Uh, and the truth about deep fakes is it's not just that we are at risk of believing what's not true, 
um, but that we stop believing what is true. We come, become so disoriented in a sea of all this information uh, that we lack a critical discourse and, and direction. Uh, and I think that that's a real risk. And we have already started to see in some you know, geopolitical situations mm -hmm. deep fakes being used, um, but we were able to kind of detect that. There have been companies that have had systems or, or Microsoft has been a big, big player in kind of flagging that. Mm -hmm. But it's very much a cat-mouse scenario. We don't have an actual plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I do think deep fakes present quite an emerging threat. Uh, and that should be part of the, the tech education curriculum and discussion points. How do we spot these? How do we know to even look for them in the, in the first place? What about voice mimicking? Mm -hmm, that as well. I would kind of put that, so there's deep fake audio, deep fake visual. Um, I would kind of lump that all in together. Mm -hmm. um, and the technology is just further advancing. So you had men mentioned chat uh, GPT. There are similar technologies where you can take a three-second clip of somebody's voice and use it to generate an entire podcast that they never were featured on. Um, and so on the one hand, it's going to be great for creators and all of these new tools and resources. Uh, but on another end, it's the disinformation and misinformation can be produced at a fraction of the cost um, and at a fraction of, of the speed. Uh, and that, I think, is quite an emerging threat that we need to tune into. Um, th that's uh, very nerve-wracking. Did you, uh, recently, when you were talking about uh, we're talking about the mimicking of the voices, but when we talk about art, you know, art comes from a place of experience and emotion and um, someone's perspective. But recently there was um, this, uh, I guess, not controversy, but more conversation uh, about this one app that could create images of all of us that were just stunning. Uh, where, what are your thoughts about that? Like the um, AI in the spaces kind of in art and uh, creating works of poetry and literature? Mm -hmm. So I think there's definitely been a lot more uh, hesitance or kind of pushback on AI stepping into these creative realms. Uh, and for many reasons, I think up until this point, we thought creativity was something that's uniquely human. And to see it be synthesized uh, by an AI system, it's very alarming because it changes how we relate to ourselves as humans, right? Poetry, um, art, music, those are things that we think only some humans are even naturally endowed with. Mm -hmm. And to see it get passed to a machine uh, seems very jarring, um, but I think every single industry is gonna be impacted by technology uh, and the world of the arts is, is no different. And I'm looking forward to what could be unleashed uh, in an optimistic way when we all have access to creative tools. Mm -hmm. um, I do think if you are more naturally endowed with artistic skill, you could use an AI system much better uh, than somebody who can't paint or, or make music. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think it's that you know, artists go away, they can you know, adopt these tools for themselves. But I think that there will be some magic to, to happen when we all have access to these systems to help bring different types of content or creative expression to life. Is that the optimism that you were talking about, that one day possibly we would all have access to these tools? Yeah, I think um, that would be the goal, that we could all kind of have a access to them. I think, of course, there are risks that come again with, with everybody of access, having access to these types of tools. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it could be quite a great turning point uh, for society if we use them and adopt them correctly um, and we're informed in, in how to utilize them. Well, there's been more effort on AI regulation in recent years. The AI Act in Europe, uh, those potentially concerned about chatbots being used in class assignments, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts on regulation and reaction to emerging tech? Mm -hmm. So there is the, when it comes to ChatGPT and the recent chatbots, some schools have leaned to just ban it outright. Um, and I think we're- The schools might ban it, but the kids will find a way to use the it. The kids are gonna use it anyways. And I think we're moving in the wrong direction because the purpose of education is to prepare students for the economy of tomorrow. And that economy is gonna be largely underscored by technologies such as ChatGPT and other AI systems. So we really do need to be equipping kids uh, with not even just the skills to utilize these tools so they can actually be productive people in the economy, uh, but to utilize them safely, right? So when we have conversations around misinformation and disinformation and the risks these systems present, uh, if we're just banning them, uh, we're banning an opportunity uh, for the next generation to adopt these tools wisely uh, and steer their future in a, in a direction that they want to use it, or to, for it to go, sorry. And I think most of our current education systems is, are largely 
transitioning or encouraging kids for jobs of the past, not transitioning into the jobs of the future. Uh, and that means we've got to adopt these technologies, we've got to lean into them, uh, and we have to also equip students with the skills to build them as well. To be, uh, in, in, instead of being, um, I guess, content, instead of just being the users, actually be the creators. Mm -hmm. Be the creators and, and the critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. um, when social media became a part of our lives, I think a lot of us didn't realize um, that putting so much of our personal information might come back later to bite us. Uh, parents sharing photos of their children. I've done this and I did it without consent when they were younger. Um, and if you are younger, you might share something that decades later might impact your employment. And sometimes scammers only need your email address to destroy your life. Um, should all jurisdictions be following the EU's lead with their right to be forgotten privacy law? Absolutely. I think data for many reasons. Uh, could be a national security crisis. Uh, having a bunch of, having citizen data just open, uh, manipulated, accessible to not only just different companies, but different countries, uh, I think that that's a really big red flag. Uh, and then of course, for, for personal reasons, you should be, have the right to be forgotten uh, or for a company not to be able to make a statistical prediction as to you, what your next moves are gonna be uh, because they've been hoarding a bunch of information on you uh, throughout your life. So I think the EU is definitely moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think companies would, or countries sorry, would be wise to, to follow suit. Do you think that maybe this is in part um, why some people are skeptical of AI technology and maybe this future of automation? Because it just kind of feels as if you're the user, but not you're not in control of what's happening around you. Mm -hmm. I think the the fear and kind of pessimism towards AI in the future. There's a few reasons. Some of it's pop culture related, mm -hmm. tuning into shows like Black Mirror, The Matrix. Um, but then again, yes, of course, a lot of our interactions with technology, uh, we feel like it's happening to us, uh, not with us. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it seems like there's five or six companies uh, and maybe seven or eight people kind of steering our future, uh, and that feels quite alarming. But I think if you equip people with the right information and tools to participate in creating the technologies um, that they're going to be using, I think that can change kind of the discourse and, and the direction. And at the beginning of the pandemic, work for a lot of people changed. Um, a lot of people, uh, if you were able to, you were able to work from home. Kids were learning online, as I mentioned. What would you say are the upsides to the future of work? Right. So I think the pandemic showed us who were we incorrectly excluding from the workforce because we falsely assumed that everybody had to show up nine to five, Monday to Friday. Uh, that opened up a whole new door for, for new parents or people with different mobility needs. Uh, so that was a, a kind of key shining light. Uh, I think the future of work is gonna be a lot more flexible. So we've already been moving away from the days where you work for a single company for 10 years, uh, and that trend is gonna continue. The, pandemic and, and technology showed us that flexibility can work uh, and it kind of prepared us for what more remote and more transient uh, kind of workplaces look like. And I think that that is something that's that's optimistic and, and helpful. Well, from your view, um, I think for employees, it works uh, to have a little bit of leverage now. But from the perspective of the employers, how are they taking that future of work? Are they adjusting well? Or are they going to fight it maybe? Uh, I, I guess it kind of depends on the company. And I think we are adjusting well as employees, but I think we don't even fully realize what's coming. So uh, when I say more remote work, or um, and what I'm really referring to is in a world where smart machines uh, learn new tricks over time, it becomes much less likely that a company is going to hire for a full-time role if that role is going to be radically changed in the next year or two years. Uh, so we're going to see a rise of, of the gig economy uh, across all jobs. So we see a lot of, you know, whether you're a delivery you know, driver or whatnot, we'll see it across financial analysts, lawyers, physicians, teachers, uh, where we all work in kind of different roles for a few different companies at any one time. Um, and in, in terms of are we embracing that, are companies embracing that, uh, I don't think we're, we're ready yet. Uh, but I think things like remote work have been helpful in kind of laying the foundation for how those systems and infrastructures could operate. Um, a few, couple of years ago, you wrote how we need to stop asking uh, kids what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, what did you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And I know that that question is usually asked with the best intention. Uh, but the reality is most of the jobs that uh, a child would see today or, or answer that question with 
probably won't exist by the time they are in a working age or they'll be radically transformed. Uh, so instead of kind of setting people up, and it's not for, for failure, but um, for the idea that your identity is attached to the job that you do, when we know the future of work is gonna be very different, we should be encouraging kids to think more broadly about the problems that they want to solve um, because those are, are more likely to exist than a specific occupation. Um, and especially as technology continues to more rapidly disrupt the workforce, we have to move away from this idea that you are your job um, because that's going to change. So if we can start with kids and encouraging them, you know, what are the skills that you want to learn and the problems that you want to solve? Um, and one of the most important skills for the future being critical thinking and imagination, that's something that children are already naturally endowed with. Lean into that. The curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, when you said that, I kind of felt like, oh, I think that, might, that might, that's hard for people to hear. It is, but you know, 15 years ago, the role of a social media manager analyst didn't exist. Now, if a company doesn't have one, you're probably not going to make it. Mm. Uh, so it, the trend lines aren't very different. There are significant, and you, whether you're a, a data analyst, a data scientist, all of these jobs have really come to the forefront in, in the last decade. Um, and so that's still going to continue going forward. But I think the future always seems a lot more shocking from the present, mm -hmm. and especially when we analyze it uh, through the frameworks of the present. Um, how can we empower then uh, people to embrace technology and to leverage it? I think leaning into it, you know, the, the best thing we can do about the future is prepare for it. It's not going to go away. Um, to recognize how much you already use it. I don't know about you, I can't get down the street without consulting maybe Google Maps. Uh, so we use AI. It, all of the time, social media, if you watch a streaming platform. So to know that these tools aren't as overwhelming as we might make them out to be. They're very actually easy to, to use, but it's about leaning into it, um, doing your best to try to understand it and, and keep up with the discourse with it. Um, and then of course, at, at a more societal and federal level, level, equipping people with the resources they're gonna need to thrive uh, in such a dynamic future. Sinead, it's been amazing having you here. I, I could talk to you for another hour. Thank you so much. Um, continued success to you. Thank, Thank you. you, all the best. The arrival suddenly of artificial intelligence in people's everyday lives has unsettled even those normally very bullish on new technologies. But what if the raw power of this technology could mean finding potential cures and treatments in weeks rather than years or decades? That's already happening. So let's find out more with, in Palo Alto, California, Daphne Collar, co-founder and CEO of the biotechnic company in Citro, and an adjunct professor of computer science and pathology at Stanford University. In Atlanta, Georgia, Anant Matabushi, professor of biomedical engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology and Emory University. And here in our studio, Laura Rosella, professor and Canada research chair in population health analytics at the University of Toronto and education lead at Temerty Center for Artificial Intelligence Intelligence Research and Education in Medicine. Welcome, Laura. Thank you in so studio, much. And to those on the line. So last month, more than 1,800 people signed a letter, including Elon Musk and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, calling for a six-month pause on the development of AI. Laura, I'm going to start with you. Many are clearly concerned about the downside of AI, but how would you characterize the promise of AI in advancing science, especially in medicine and in healthcare? Yeah, well, in science and in medicine, we use data for all of our tasks to test hypotheses, to develop models, to make discoveries, to make predictions. And so AI and machine learning is helping us use more data, data we couldn't use before, much more quickly in a much more sophisticated way. So the idea is that we can actually take the promise of the, that new efficiency and new ability to look at new data, and that'll enhance the, the scientific work that we do faster and perhaps open up new avenues. All right, same question to you, Anant. How would you characterize sort of the promise of AI in advancing uh, the medical field? Yeah, thank you, Jan. I think the opportunity is tremendous for AI in health and medicine, particularly when you think about some of the big challenges and problems that we face today, problems around health disparities, problems around global health, particularly in low and middle income countries, areas of the world where there is not a pathologist or a radiologist in the entire country. 
And that's where I see the big opportunity for artificial intelligence to really make a difference in those areas of the world that really are underserved and don't have access to medicine and healthcare and AI really being that great leveler. Daphne, is AI ushering in a new era of science? I think it is because, as Laura said, we are in a world where we have the opportunity to collect a tremendous amount of data about human biology, and human biology is incredibly complicated, far too complicated for the human mind to fully understand. And um, and many of the diseases that remain with unmet need today are probably not one disease, and we're probably not characterizing them correctly. Alzheimer's is not a single disease. And if we are able to collect enough data about human biology and use the power of machine learning and artificial intelligence to disentangle what we see there, maybe we can finally characterize the right subsets of patient population and find um, uh, interventions that have a meaningful effect size. And that would be transformative. With that, I want to look at some recent advancements in medicine using AI. Science Magazine's 2021 Breakthrough of the Year was powered by AI and its ability to predict protein structures in the body. Last month, researchers used artificial intelligence to detect Alzheimer's risk with over 90% accuracy. And earlier this year, researchers used AI to discover a potential new cancer drug in less than 30 days in what usually takes years or even decades. Laura, I'm gonna to come to you. Uh, machine learning and AI have been around for a while. Uh, what is happening now that is enabling these breakthroughs? You sort of mentioned it a little bit off the top, data. Yeah, we have uh, the data that we just did not have before. So the fundamental you know, mathematical basis of, of AI machine learning has been around for a while, but we did not have the amount of data that we have now and the granularity of that data. And then we didn't have the computational ability to process that data. So theoretically, we could do this, but now we can actually practically do it. We have the horsepower behind it to actually make these discoveries happen. And that's been the biggest change. This is something that uh, we harp on here in in this country is that in Canada, we don't have a lot of data. Uh, where are we getting our data from? Is this a publicly sourced data? Is where, where are we scouring for it? Yeah, the data come from lots of different sources. So from the biological uh, point of view, data can come from the cells um, and what we measure at the cellular level and the biological level. For data I work with on humans, we get it from interactions with the healthcare system. We're doing more and more surveys and detailed measurements. It can come from non-traditional sources like social media, <laughs> our, our devices. And so it's actually coming from all these different places. I work with environmental data, so it's coming from the sensors that measure things in the environment, images in the environment. So it's not coming from one place, it's coming from many places. And it's very variable. That's the hardest part. As you say, about is it. there some biases to this with science? Is it very methodical in terms of how we get our data? Is, is there bias in some of the data that we have? Yes, there's a lot of bias, and this is the part that makes people probably the most uncomfortable. Um, the data, the data generating processes are non-random when we work mm. with this data. Um, I, as an epidemiologist, obsessed with bias sure. a, lo a lot. Um, so we think carefully about what the biases are, how we can mitigate it against them. And of course, having more data, independent replication, making sure we're not just working in one center, but multiple centers. These are some of the ways we overcome some of the biases. All right, Anant, I wanna come back to you. I wanna go back to uh, the, the recent advancement and sort of the excitement. What areas of research are you seeing the most exciting results using AI? So I think that there's been a lot of progress around AI for diagnostics. <clears throat> well, I think there is something like 300 technologies that have now been approved by the FDA in the United States for primary diagnosis of multiple different indications. There's a lot happening in the realm of ophthalmology. There's work that's going on in the cardiology space. But looking forward, I think beyond disease diagnosis, I think the opportunity is tremendous when it comes to predicting outcome, when it comes to predicting therapeutic response. And I think that that's where I see the next frontier, where we, in the United States, for instance, 40% of the adult population is gonna be diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. And the big question is, how do you manage these patients? We know that you can't be hitting all these patients up with aggressive treatments. I think a big question for us today is better management for patients with a disease. And I believe that the next frontier will be the use of AI to help and tailor the appropriate treatment strategies and management options for patients going forward. Daphne, my natural follow-up is, how is AI changing the discovery of new drugs uh, to treat 
said range of diseases? So I think first and foremost is identification of the right patient population, because I think we have some really um, compelling treatments today, but when you apply them at the population level, you have some subset that responds and a very large number that do not. And for those that do not respond, you've basically introduced a tremendous amount of toxicity. You've prevented them from uh, benefiting from a treatment that might actually help them. So I think disentangling the complexity of disease to understand what are the right population subsets so that you can create a therapeutic intervention with a meaningful effect size is a critical part of it. And then the next part is identifying intervenable causal nodes that if you actually modulate those nodes, those proteins or other metabolites in the body, it will actually make a difference to those to that coherent group of patients. And we're seeing a tremendous amount of development on the drug discovery side in first uh, deconvoluting the patient population, interrogating causality, and then, um, and then figuring out how to construct chemical matter of whatever, whether it's a small molecule or a large molecule or a gene therapy that would actually make a meaningful difference in intervening at that node. So I think there is just progress all throughout that that process that's happening and is being driven by AI. Daphne, what have you come up with in terms of that research there? So in our work, um, first of all, I want to return to Laura's point. We um, take very great care in how we uh, collect and uh, generate our data. So in addition to collecting data from human populations, we also have a cell factory that generates um, stem cells and uh, from human-derived populations, patients, um, healthy controls so that we can actually um, measure disease at the cellular level. And, um, and so we have done some really exciting work in, uh, in various diseases in neuroscience as well as in oncology and uncovered what we believe are a compelling new class of targets for um, for genetic epilepsies, which is the first therapeutic area that we moved into, as well as in the domain of cancer, identified both new targets as well as, importantly, new patient populations for drugs that already exist are quite safe, are effective, but are not deployed in the right patient populations. And so those are the fastest paths to clinical impact um, for, um, for getting into patients because the path of getting from a target to an approved drug is quite a long one. Working with an existing drug is sometimes a much faster path. All right, Laura, I'm going to come to you. Uh, we're going to get granular in our research here. You used uh, a machine learning model to analyze health data of 2.1 million people living in Ontario. What were you able to discover? We, would, we were able to accurately predict who among that population would develop diabetes in the next five years, type two with <laughs> diabetes. And the idea behind it is if we understand who can develop type two diabetes, who is likely to, we can prevent it. Type two diabetes can be prevented. We have uh, well-known interventions that can prevent the onset or delay the onset of type two diabetes. So if we know who's most at risk, we can target those interventions more appropriately. How accurate can we get? Can we get to the individualness? This is a good question. I mean, m no model really gets to the individual level um, per se because what machine learning does and what all of these models do is say someone that looks like this with these characteristics on average, this is their likelihood of developing an outcome. So we can be very accurate for an individual, certainly, um, but every individual will have slight nuances for sure. But much more accurate than me just trying to guess, oh yeah, you have one, two or three risk factors, you're probably going to develop diabetes. We can then use hundreds of variables, much more nuanced information. We're going to get much closer to our ability to predict the fact that you will or will not develop diabetes. All right, my next question, it's a dangerous one because I'm, I, we could get in the weeds here. For sure. But how were you able to do that exactly? Is there an example that we can sort of understand of how you were able to sort of get hone in on, on these, on people who were at higher risk? Yeah, I mean, so simplistically, the way these models work is they go through all these variables and they lump together characteristics that are most likely appearing in individuals that do develop diabetes and do not, and they essentially sort through and trying to identify common patterns between those individuals. It's a lot more complicated than <laughs> that, but we take in information on the history past interactions with the health system, uh, other conditions they might have, other risk factors, their age. And so putting all these things together, you can come up with a score to determine, you know, based on all these factors put together, this person's likely to develop an outcome. And in this case, we know what we're trying to predict, right. which is type two diabetes. 
case. But sometimes these methods can be used where we don't know. We're just trying to group some groups together right. that might be more similar than others. And in that case, it's much more of a discovery uh, angle, saying we know there's some commonality here. We don't know yet what to do, but we can try things. Mm. And I think that's some of the work that you heard about. Very interesting. All right, Anant, I'm going to talk to you about another disease, uh, cancer. How have you been able to use AI to improve outcomes for people with cancer? Yeah, thank you for that, Jane. So our group has been really interested in how we could use AI with routinely acquired data. So we're talking about radiologic scans, CT scans, MRI scans, but also pathology images to be able to really figure out which of these patients has the more aggressive variant of the disease and therefore is going to benefit from more aggressive treatments like radiation or chemotherapy vis-a-vis -vis those patients where perhaps the disease is not quite as aggressive and some of these patients might benefit from perhaps no chemotherapy or a lower dosage of radiation therapy or in some cases like in the case of prostate cancer there are several men who might benefit from no intervention at all because we have a much less aggressive variant of the disease. And so there's a big opportunity that we're finding with AI, with machine learning, to be able to tease out patterns from these radiologic samples, uh, images, from the pathology images, to be able to really help risk stratify those patients who need the more aggressive treatment regimens versus those patients who might benefit from a less aggressive uh, variation of uh, treatment strategies because they have a more indolent or less aggressive uh, uh, cancer. Daphne, in your experience with drug discovery, to what extent is AI helping us discover things that human scientists could never discover? So I would like to uh, um, begin where Anant left off, which is with the incredible amount of information that exists in uh, in images such as histopathology and radiology. And in many of those cases, when we apply um, machine learning to those images, we uncover patient populations that humans would never have been able to identify. Um, subtle uh, patterns within the histopathology images, which is an incredibly information-rich source, and also collected abundantly because pretty much every solid cancer uh, patient has that has a biopsy taken as part of the standard of care. And so we've been able to take uh, those large populations within, say, uh, breast cancer, within colorectal cancer, and identify patient subgroups where a particular gene is driving, seems to be driving the cancer in ways that are not necessarily the case for other patients that have what is labeled as the same cancer as part of their medical record. And that drive gene is now a novel cancer target, but importantly, neither the patient population nor the fact that that gene is driving the cancer would have been identified by a human pathologist uh, because the patterns there are too subtle for uh, a person to have necessarily picked up on. Now, what's interesting is that sometimes once we've discovered that, we've uh, developed methods for visualization, for explainability, so that we can show the pathologist what it is that the cancer is picked up on. And that's important because it also also allows us to gain confidence that what's been discovered is not artifactual, it's, it's actually real, it's not some kind of a, a biases in the data, as Laura was alluding to earlier, but it also helps teach the pathologists something new about, um, about tumors and, um, and how the cancer uh, is different in, in different populations. So, it's, um, so it teaches us new biology at the same time that it uncovers potential new and impactful intervention nodes. All right, with that, let's talk about some of the challenges here. And to get into that, I want to read a quote from a Scientific American. AI is currently hampered by a lack of transparency. This lack of transparency has been nicknamed the black box problem because no one can see inside the network to explain its thought process. Not only does this opacity undermine trust in the results, it also limits how much neural networks can contribute to humans' scientific understanding of the world. First off, Laura. Why can't we see into this black box? Well, the black box is an issue, but I actually think we need to get much more specific about what we Let's need. Let's do it. And, and, and Daphne alludes to this as well. So to me, there's at least three parts of the black box. There's interpretability. We need to know what's in these models. Explainability. How are the different components contributing to how the model makes decisions? And then there's transparency, which is a big one. I, I would say that's 
the one that's probably most problematic nowadays because it's done so variable. Um, and that is the way the model is constructed needs to be very clear, clearly documented, standardized. It needs to be reproducible. Someone needs to be able to independently verify it. And so right now, none of those things are happening right. consistently, and all of that's contributing to the black box. And so once we do have those things in place, I think we'll feel a lot more comfortable. It's not as simple as, oh, I just need to see, look under the hood and see what's in the model and all, all is okay. All those aspects actually need to be working for us to feel more comfortable. In terms of the black box and, and sort of AI's contribution, when a scientist goes in, are we getting a step-by-step -step in terms of how it got to that result? Not consistently. Hmm. Um, and some of it we can't fully explain. Right. Uh, so some of it is something that, oh, this is new. This is a pattern I wasn't expecting. We haven't seen this before, which is not necessarily a problem, but it means it has to be verified. Someone else in another institution might want to verify that. We might want to check it. We might want to do further experimentation. So it's just a step one. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's pretty complicated. It's not as simple as just saying, oh, these are the variables in the model and stopping there. All right, we're going to pick up on that a little later, but I want to bring uh, Daphne into this. How big of a challenge is the black box problem? I think it both is and is not. So uh, there's techniques that uh, people have developed, including ourselves, to help people see into the black box and, and and sort of interpret what it is that the computer is picking up on. And it's especially easy in the context of images because you can visualize um, different variables and what it is um, in the image space that um, that give rise to different conclusions. And so that gives, I think, people a much greater sense of confidence about what is going on. I think the other aspect which is um, important to emphasize in, in drug discovery specifically, is that uh, where the hypothesis came from um, matters up to a point, but ultimately you're going to be subject to the same rigorous test that every other drug is subject to, which is a randomized clinical trial. And so in the same way that we don't necessarily ask people where a particular drug hypothesis came from when we go into the clinical trial phase, because we know that there is a sort of fundamental ground truth verification process, which is, does this work on a randomized case control population? And I think that's a really important component that um, that gives us confidence in, in any drug that we put into a human. And then in general, if we can't understand or see how AI has arrived to some potential promising, at some potential promising results, uh, you know, we throw the words of confidence and transparency, how can we trust those results? Yeah, so uh, so thanks for that, Jay. And just to keep things interesting, I'm going to be a little contrarian and, <laughs> and maybe disagree a little bit with Daphne there. So I can give a very specific example of where the black box really came back to hurt us. About six years ago, we were working on a project looking at the use of AI to predict heart failure from endomyocardial biopsies. And we trained a network. Uh, we were able to demonstrate from a single institution that this network was able to predict the risk of heart failure based of what the network had learned or what the, the, the black box had learned from these biopsy images. And we were stunned by the results. We actually showed in, in a paper that the black box outperformed cardiac pathologists by 25%. We were ecstatic. But the postscript to that story is that a few months later, we got another tranche of images from that same institution and when we ran the network again, the performance fell from the 97% that we'd achieved on the first pass to a 75% result, which was more in line with what the pathologists had been getting. And we found out only after much interrogation that what had happened between the first tranche of images and the second tranche of images was that a remote software upgrade had been applied to the scanner that had been used to digitize the slides. And that very subtle change in the appearance of the images had perturbed the network enough that it had drastically changed its performance from the 97% to down to 75%. And so because of that experience, our group has really focused on very intentionally interpretable approaches. And you know, while we talk about the promise of AI to discover things that we don't know, one of the things to consider in all of this is that there is a huge body of knowledge that has been amassed for many diseases over the course of, of decades and, and potentially hundreds of years. Let's take histopathology as one example that you know, Daphne referenced as well. You know, pathologists have been looking at slides under a microscope for over 100 years. 
And there's a deep well of knowledge that we have about the kind of hallmarks and patterns that are associated with more aggressive and less aggressive disease. The challenge is that pathologists don't do a very good job in terms of reproducibly identifying these hallmarks. And that's where I think the AI can be so powerful, because if the AI could help identify in a reproducible fashion these patterns, these hallmarks, then we are able to have very intentionally interpretable AI from the get-go and can demonstrate its relevance for diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment response prediction. Lauren, you to that chime. Oh. Yeah, Daphne, if you want to respond, yes. I'd love to respond, if that's okay. So I completely agree that there is an incredible body of knowledge and that we should be mindful of that. But I think if we just focus on reproducibly and reliably doing what a pathologist can already do, we are missing an incredible opportunity to discover new concepts. And I will refer back to a paper that I wrote back in uh, 2011, which was one of the first machine learning analyses of histopathology data, which basically discovered the importance of the tumor microenvironment to cancer prognosis at a time when we did not realize that as a community. So it was one of the first earliest harbing, harbingers of the importance of the tumor microenvironment, specifically because uh, we did not restrict the model to trying to do something that replicated what pathologists are already doing. So that being said, I completely agree that this needs to be done with care. There needs to be replication, ideally across distinct hospitals, not just doing with uh, verification within a single hospital system and a single scanner device, but really replication across ideally multiple cohorts. Um, there needs to be an explainability component trying to help us understand what the machine is picking up on. And as I said, in the context of drug discovery, the ultimate proof is a run randomized clinical trial, which is really hard to, um, to fake. So I think I agree that we need to do this with very great care and that it's easy, especially with modern day machine learning, to fall into a trap of, uh, of getting to really ridiculously high performances that are not driven by anything that is biologically meaningful. Completely agree with that, but I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater in preventing the machine from identifying new and important insights that a person did not previously discover. All right, moving on. Laura, we know AI can detect patterns and make predictions when it's got massive amounts of data. We know it's limited in sort of explaining why something is happening and, and what is causing it. Does this mean that AI will never replace human scientists? There's a fear out there with every industry, right? Yeah. That AI is coming for us. But yeah. in this, with science, this is a, this is a different realm. But the, the amount of progress that's been made is quite tremendous. Yeah, I don't think of the term replace when I think of AI. Um, and lots of people go there right away. I always think of augmenting. And so I don't, I think it'll augment the work of scientists for sure. Um, and uh, causality and understanding why things happen is a great example. There are important parts of that process. It's a multi-step process and some pretty key steps that need to be taken to really understand why. And machine learning can play a role in some of those steps and actually can help us get to that more quickly. It can open us up our eyes to new possibilities that we weren't seeing before, but we still have to go through all the steps. So. I don't see it replacing. I mean, I'm a little hesitant to make any predictions in this space, given <laughs> the progress we've seen uh, in, the, in the past uh, year, even. Um, but I see it much more as augmenting the work that scientists do and you know, still making sure that we keep the rigor and the domain knowledge that we've amassed uh, over the years in that process. Ananta, I want to get your take on that as well. Yeah, so I think that the... The, the, these, these prophecies of doom are not new, right? So AI is going to take away the clinician's job, AI is going to replace the pathologist, AI is going to replace the radiologist. As a history buff, I've gone back and looked at some of the stories that came out you know, 30 years ago in the context of digital mammography. When digital mammography came out in the late 80s or early 90s, and some machine learning companies were stood up to analyze digital mammography, you could see these prophecies of doom, you know, you're not going to need radiologists anymore. Mm. You fast forward three decades on, we still have a paucity of radiologists, we have a shortage of pathologists. So I agree 100% that we really need to be thinking about augmentation, we need to be thinking about assisting. And I think that one of the, one, one of the things that's been said more recently about AI is that yes, it is likely that in the next five to 10 years, the radiologist or the pathologist who is using AI might obviate the radiologist or pathologist who does not. Hmm. Daphne, 
could AI develop to the point where it can create its own genuine scientific understanding? I, I, I might be going a, far, a stretch here, but think like an AI Einstein. Uh, boy, um, <laughs> I tend to be wary of predictions saying AI will never do X, Y, and Z, because in the past, whenever we have made such predictions, um, they have turned out to be, in many cases, false. I don't know if never, but honestly, I take I tend to agree with, uh, with Laura that scientific endeavor is one of the places where it's the ultimate creativity of the human mind, and it is certainly the case that a human can be hugely um, uh, supercharged, if you will, by having access to the kind of interrogation tools that allow a human to extract patterns um, and insights from very large amounts of data, which the human mind will never be able to uh, to process. But I think that the, that the partnership between the human and the computer is where we're going to see the greatest insights. Now, will a computer come up with insights on its own? Probably, but I still think that the greatest insights are going to come from that partnership. All right, Laura, it's been said that when Einstein made his big breakthrough re with relativity, only a handful of people in the world actually understood it. Could AI, or an AI Einstein, produce a scientific breakthrough that no human could understand? So I think that an AI could generate uh, a starting step of a discovery that we will eventually understand. Um, so I think that signals will come up. Some of them will be false. Some of them will be because of a bias or a spurious finding, and we have to do a process to get there. And some of them truly will be new paths of understanding that we did not yet have. Um, so I think it could start us on that path. And I, I'm confident, though, that eventually with the processes that we use in science, we will eventually understand. It might take us time, though. So it might be signaling us something that we don't yet understand, but I'm confident that we will be able to get there in time. All right, we are going to leave it there. Daphne, Anand, Laura, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Very, very riveting stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Tomorrow on the agenda. A significant change needs to be made in schooling so that um, we, we deal with partly an inequity here because some families can go access help, have more wherewithal to kind of have these conversations at home. But And I'm not saying teachers should become mental health experts or deal with uh, mental illness, but it is important that we're thinking about what needs to change in the system. Also, tomorrow on the agenda. And I was going to Al-Anon for families, trying to understand how to support her and I had to recognize supporting my sister had to be from a distance because it was the only way that was safe and continuing to enable her was doing nothing. That's tomorrow on the agenda.